much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it, Paige. Um, yeah, so I was uh, asked for a little bit of background info. So I'm a manufacturing engineer by training, worked in the mining industry for about five years in the late 90s, and um, have been in, yeah, well, I was already a mature adult at that point, sir. Um, <laughs> I uh, have been in Summit County full-time for, uh, my goodness, six years now, and a, de and a Colorado uh, resident since 89. So as soon as I was old enough to, to uh, pack my bags and move out here, I did, much to my parents' dismay. But uh, I'll be seeing them in Michigan soon, so that's the way that goes. Um, in any case, I got excited about gold prospecting when I was six years old. We didn't have a TV. And my dad used to curl up on the couch with my little brother and me and read National Geographic magazine to us or whatever he had to read. We would just curl up and read with dad. And he read an article about a gold rush that was happening in Australia at the time. And I got all excited. And the next day, I went out in the front yard and dug a gold mine. <laughs> I think in context of a six-year-old, the hole was probably about like this, by this, by about that. The memory I have in my head was of sitting on the edge of the hole with my feet in it and digging you know, with a little garden trowel. Now, the good news, there was no lawn in the front yard at that point. The house was brand new, so I didn't get in trouble. <laughs> was there any gold? In well, you know, there wasn't. There, I, I brought some precious, some pretty rocks in and showed my mom my pretend gold. <laughs> the funny thing is what I learned later is that area of Michigan does have gold mm -hmm. because there were glaciers that pushed it down from western Ontario. And um, the area where my parents live is basically clay. Right? I mean, you, you have the hardest time even growing grass there. But the good news about clay is gold can't get through it to hide deeper in the earth. It tends instead to wash off and concentrate in the creeks. So whatever the glaciers deposited was probably in the little creek a half a block from my house, and I didn't even know, right? I was so close, right? But, you know, I remedied that. One of the first weekends we lived here in Colorado in 89, I learned gold pan and bought a couple of pans and Kind of have run hot and cold on how much time I had for that kind of thing, raising kids and everything. But um, today, it's very much a passion and something I've been, been sharing stories about our history with people and stories about actual gold prospecting. I have lots of show and tell items, so we'll get to that too. Yes? Did you ever find any? Where? Anywhere. Oh, heavens, yes, all the time in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, sure. Here's part of my trophy case. So absolutely, yeah. It's, it's out there. It's out there a stone's throw from here, in fact. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that, shall we? So what we're going to cover today is, first of all, a focus on Summit County, right? Rather than the whole of Colorado, we will focus in as much as practical on what happened here before the rush, when the gold rush actually happened, and then what happened afterwards. Because Summit County story is a little more interesting than some parts of the state, because we actually had multiple gold rushes and busts or crashes. Uh, and we'll talk about where you can see some of the history, like, of course, the Frisco Museum and Historic Park, and where you do stuff if you want to actually try gold panning, right? Um, by the way, the picture on the left is another uh, trophy shot of flakes from um, my prospecting, and you see the little vials on the left of really small stuff. For context, the, the vials are this, okay? But this right here holds almost $1,000 worth of gold if you fill it which the bottom one's full in that picture. So it does add up, right? And I will tell you, if you handle a full vial, it feels weird because you, your brain says how much something this size should weigh, and the real life is it weighs about three or four times that much. So it just doesn't feel right somehow, you know? Gold is much, much more dense than almost anything else on Earth. It's one of the reasons we can easily prospect for it because it always settles to the bottom. And um, the other reason it's easy to prospect for is it stays looking like gold. That's straight out of the creek. I didn't have to do anything to it, right? Whereas other minerals tend to rust or oxidize or tarnish, depending on the word you want to use, but they all mean the same thing. It's the metal combining with something else, right? Anyway, let's move on to our stories. So first of all, I always like to acknowledge the people who were here before the US citizens showed up, before it was the United States. And in this case, that's primarily uh, Native Americans. There were um, some um, um, Spanish-speaking people. The southern part of Colorado was uh, part of Mexico until 1848, so um, uh, I should acknowledge that too, and that's not really on this map. But what this does is highlight where uh, the various Native American groups were 
Um, most of what we have here on the map is the Ute tribal bands. The Cheyenne and Arapaho would have been off on the eastern plains, so on the very east edge of this map. But what you see is each of the different bands, they're all Utes, and they all spoke the same language. They still do, for that matter. It's not like they're gone. We just pushed them off of the land to a great extent. Um, and they did have interaction with each other on a routine basis, including, you can see the circle for Summit County. So the White River Band and the um, band just to the south of us, which would have been in South Park and along the Southern Front Range and the Wet Mountain Valley, uh, both of those bands would come up into Summit County in the summertime. And I imagine you can easily guess the first reason. The weather was better. It's nice up here in the summer, right? It gets pretty darn hot. You know, the White River Band, you think about them wintering over by Craig someplace. That's a smart idea in the winter. In the summer, it seems like a really dumb idea, right? <laughs> All of the game would move to higher ground, right, where there was better forage. And so they would migrate as well. And the Utes um, would migrate into Summit County and spend their summers here. We don't have any evidence of them gold prospecting here, but we do know that they followed herds of bison that migrated into the area uh, from the south and herds of other animals, especially um, deer and antelope and elk that would migrate east from the Craig area, although I doubt those animals actually got all the way to Summit County. Uh, in any case, one of the interesting little side facts about that is that the Utes would set fire to the valley here every fall as they left. And the reason they did that was because they wanted lots of forage for the bison and other animals, and they didn't want it to become all forested. So they would light a fire and leave every year. And the last year they left, there were already lots of US citizens here, because it was the early 1880s, I want to say, and they set the fire anyway. And you can't blame them in a way, because they'd been told they weren't, they weren't welcome to come back, which was pretty uncool, if you ask me. But it's the reason we have so many lodgepole pines here, and the reason for the beetle kill event uh, is because the Native Americans for probably over a thousand years every year would set fires and lodgepoles respond well to a burned landscape, right? Some of their cones only release their seeds in a fire environment, whereas other evergreens, um, you can manage to wipe them out if you just keep burning the land, that you'll, you'll put an end to them. So a lot of our lodgepoles that are, that are especially near the valley areas um, are essentially an engineered landscape, engineered by the Native Americans that were here before us. Um, anyway, there were a lot of conflicts with the Arapaho and the Cheyenne because when you came summertime, the animals that were out on the plains would move up into the mountains and the Arapaho and Cheyenne would come with them and uh, have a lot of battles with the Utes because the Utes viewed the mountain lands as their territory straight up. Um, they were in fact able to enforce that in the south and southwest part of the state until uh, the 1873 um, treaties that were done after the Civil War. But let's move on. Uh, before the rush, there were discoveries of gold here in Summit County, and um, this is the, probably the most important one. Uh, General Fremont led an expedition of U.S. cavalry through a pretty good chunk of central and eastern Colorado in order to uh, continue conversations with the Native American tribes, including the Utes, about allowing migrants through. So if you think about the 1840s, people were migrating at that point uh, on the Oregon Trail, they were, uh, you know, west. They were also migrating down to Santa Fe, and there were some people trickling over into California and places like that, although not a lot until the gold rush. In any case, they sort of marched around with a, a, a large group of cavalry to make the point that you probably didn't want to quibble with the U.S. government and to, at the same time, you know, give some gifts and make some deals with the Native American tribes. And um, in 1840, General Fremont brought this guy, William Gilpin, along. He wasn't the governor yet, because we didn't have a territory yet. He, be he eventually became the first governor of the territory. But um, William Gilpin was a university-trained uh, science student. And at the time, in the 1840s, if you studied science, you studied at least some of just about everything we think of as science, right? The fields were not as well developed. So he had some botany and some geology and, and um, you know, a variety of other things. We'd call him a naturalist today, right? And um, so he kept a careful science log of what he found, and he inspected for minerals as he documented finding gold in six or seven different waterways in Colorado. And uh, interestingly, in the late 1840s, he was back in the St. Louis area and gave some academic talks about what he learned in the West. And he talked about the gold out here, 
and um, it did nothing in the way of triggering a gold rush. I can only imagine it was seen as an academic curiosity, right? In any case, um, he does later become our first governor, which is, which is interesting in its own right and a whole side story. Um, but I love that the, one of the people who found gold early on was our first governor when, it, when we were still a territory. Um, in 1849, of course, you have the California gold rush. And all these gold rushes, as you study the history, turn out to be connected together. Right? So the people in the gold rush in northern Georgia in the 1820s ending up going to California, and they're the ones with the skills. Right? The people who went to California in 1849, um, many of them came back in 1859 or 1860 to Colorado. In this, in this case, we had a group of Cherokee Indians who were from Georgia and had gold prospecting and, and gold mining experience from generations of, of um, that activity in the southeast part of the US. They came through Colorado on the way to the California Gold Rush, and they brought a whole bunch of horses with them because they figured they could trade the horses, which they bred in Oklahoma anyway, they could trade them for the supplies they need in California. And of course, you don't have to carry a horse, it carries itself. All the other supplies, you know, beans and bacon and sluices and gold pans, you'd have to carry. So they thought, well, we're gonna be the smart ones and bring our horses. However, it did slow them down a little because they got to the Metro Denver area in the spring of 1850 and the snows hadn't cleared yet in the mountains. Well, you can't bring a whole bunch of horses through the mountains where there's no fodder for them. So they had to hang out for a few weeks in Metro Denver. And of course, they panned the creeks. And they found gold in Cherry Creek. They found gold in South Platte River. They found gold in Clear Creek. And to their excitement, they found gold in a little creek that we call Ralston Creek that's in Arvada that feeds into Cherry Creek. It's named for Lewis Ralston, who was one of the Cherokee. At that point in time, the Cherokee, I think 18, mid-1800s, they'd been interacting with Europeans since the um, early 1500s. So there was enough intermarriage and um, tr you know, trading of traditions that there were lots of Cherokee who had what we would call a European style name rather than a Cherokee traditional name. And a lot of them who dressed and acted as if they were US citizens, which an important point, they were not. Since they weren't US citizens, they couldn't own mining claims as those laws evolved. Um, in any case, Lewis Ralston finds gold in what's now Ralston Creek in northwest Denver, and he finds a nugget. Gets all excited about it, but the rest of his buddies say, no, 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 we're not staying here. We're going to the gold rush in California, but they remembered. And later, when we had a banking crisis in 1857, in the whole US, just like the one we had in 2009, basically, where you couldn't borrow money if you were normal people for anything, all the farmers in the west, in, in the Midwest and East couldn't borrow money to buy the seed, to plant their crops for the year. And so an awful lot of people were looking for something else to do, including some of those Cherokee who remembered Lewis Ralston's discovery in Metro Denver, and a group of them had agreed to get together and come on out in early 1858. And come they did, explore they did, they found some gold, not enough to change their lives. In fact, they didn't make any big discoveries, but they found some, and they trickled back home for winter and as they went home, they found that there had actually been articles written about them because um, some people who'd been trading, uh, uh, a guy named James Cantrell, for example, who traded with the Mormons and then would walk, you know, take his pack horses all the way back to the Missouri River, load up and do it again, right, back and forth. Um, he had stopped and visited them. He'd seen gold. He'd brought some of the pay dirt with him and panned it out in public in Kansas City. And as the Cherokee walked home, they found that Everybody already knew who they were and was already sure they were rich and wanted to hear the stories about it. And the more they denied that they'd been really successful, the less they were believed. <laughs> so the bad news for the people who, who didn't believe them was they really hadn't found any significant amount of gold. They, both, they each went home with what today would be a few thousand dollars worth of gold. You could have spent the summer working at Wendy's and made that much money, right? <laughs> But the good news is people did find gold, and we'll get to that part in a minute, right? So the first real gold strikes did eventually occur. Um, here's Summit County, and one piece of context that we'll, we'll remember along the way is at the time, what's now Colorado was four different territories. You had New Mexico Terry in the, Territory in the southern part of the state, the Kansas Territory. The boundary there is, um, anybody know Baseline Road in Boulder, the south edge? Yes, okay, that was, the, that was the baseline that they measured from there for Kansas versus Nebraska Territory, okay? On the south edge of Boulder, essentially. 
And then, of course, the Utah Territory was everything west of the Continental Divide, including Summit County. We were part of Mormon land at that point, right? And that actually had its own problem. In 1857, a third of the U.S. Army was sent to Salt Lake City to confront the Mormons because they were refusing to submit to federal law. Federal law says that the federal government appoints the federal judges, and the Mormons were saying, no, 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 our church will take care of all legal matters. Well, that's not how we do things in the United States. The separation of church and state exists for a reason, and we butted heads with the Mormons on that, and they, of course, had to submit to the authority of the U.S. government on that one, but there's still a, um, a garrison. There's no U.S. troops in it anymore, I don't think, but there's still, the buildings are still sitting there up on the hill above um, Salt Lake City where the cannons would reach, mm -hmm. right? Just to make the point, I guess. In any case, we didn't trust the Mormons in 1859 because they had just tried to essentially separate from the U.S. And indeed, in 1861, they would lean toward the Confederacy, right? We didn't trust the people who had been Mexicans until 10 years earlier because the New Mexico Territory had been part of Mexico, right? And we didn't trust the people in Kansas because they were busy having civil war in Kansas over whether they should be a slave state or a free state. So when you find gold in Colorado, the very first thing the federal government did was draw a big box around it and make it its own territory, which is how we got to be a state. Otherwise, we wouldn't be one, right? You'd be in eastern Utah right now if it hadn't been for the gold. So there's your moment of history on that. So how did they actually find some real gold? Well, the good news was the people who were exploring for gold in 1858, the Cherokee, um, they explored all the way from down south near Pueblo all the way north to Laramie along the Front Range, and they hung out in Fort Laramie for a while and told their soldiers what they were doing. Okay, soldiers are very bored happily. There wasn't a lot for them to do, so they gossiped with everybody who came through, including these guys, George Andrew Jackson, who was at the time walking back east, gets as far as Fort Laramie and hears about the gold. He's a gold prospector coming back from California and decides not to go home after all, and he heads south into Metro Denver, um, John Hamilton Gregory also came through Fort Laramie going the other direction. He was coming from Georgia. He was a failed tobacco farmer, couldn't borrow money from the banks. Remember the banking crisis? So he gets as far as Fort Laramie and he's out of money. He's out of bullets. He's basically starving. The soldiers gossip with him, tell him about the gold that's nearby. He was thinking to go to what's now Hope, British Columbia, which is a lot longer walk from Fort Laramie than Metro Denver is, right? And um, they, the soldiers gave him enough food to get down here. So he walks down to the Metro Denver area where there's still a few of the Cherokee hanging out and a few other people that have shown up as well and decides to spend the winter with them and uh, is able to you know, pan out enough gold in the creeks in Denver to swap for meat from people who still have bullets to shoot for food and whatnot, manages to not starve. And as you can see, he makes a discovery, the first serious hard rock discovery on May 6th. George Andrew Jackson's up in Idaho Springs in early January hunting and finds gold there. My favorite part of that story is he found a nugget that he saved and later made into a ring for his wife. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. Um, but by the way, in the summer of 1859, George Andrew Jackson becomes a very rich man because he's very, very successful and goes home with what would today be something on the order of a million bucks for one summer. So not a bad deal for him. Gregory, same story, goes home a rich man at the end of the summer, sells off his his mines and stuff. Um, James Aikens is one of the people who'd heard the stories. So he was in Omaha, if I recall correctly, and pulls together a whole group of people to come out. They get as far as um, St. Vrain area. There's a fort there at the time. He gets up on the mud battlements of the fort and he looks due west and he says, those mountains look like they'd be gold bearing. Let's go there. Completely unscientific, but lucky, right? So the town of Boulder gets started by James Aikens and his uh, group. And um, he's actually the younger Aikens, James is. He is in his early 20s. His dad's really the leader of the group. But James is the spark plug. James is the one who says to the guys, once they kind of get settled in, in, um, in Boulder, well, I don't want to wait. Let's go. I don't care if it's winter. Let's go. And he talks about 10 or 12 of the guys into going with him. And they hike up Boulder Creek. They get to the area of Gold Hill. Has anybody actually been to Gold Hill? One winter, what did you think? It's a cute little place. It's a cute little place. I love it because it's still all dirt roads. It feels like, you know, they did get electricity. There is that modern convenience. But other than that, it feels a lot like it might have been back then. 
Um, I would highly recommend it. There's a cute little general store where you can get lunch, and it's gorgeous. In any case, they find gold up there, and they get organized digging, build some sluices out of wood, and so they're essentially the first successful commercial operation in the state with 10 or 20 guys digging through the winter up there because they just can't wait till spring. Summit County, much later that summer. So once the crowd shows up on the front range and is saying, where do I go, where do I go? Some of them get to Idaho Springs or Central City, not so much in Boulder because it's not as well known at that moment. And they, they go up to Idaho Springs and Central City and they see lots and lots of people already there. They get frustrated and they say, let's go over the next ridge and see what's over there. And some of those people were Reuben Spaulding and William Iliff. You might recognize Iliff because we have an Iowa street down in town and the um, religious education place, the seminary. In any case, um, they went up the South Platte River and up over Hoosier Pass, which used to be called Ute Pass, but we had too many Ute Passes, so at one point, CDOT said, you can't do that, we gotta straighten this out, right? Uh, we still have a Ute Pass in this county and we have at least two or three others, but Hoosier Pass got renamed. Um, that's where the bison used to come over, by the way. That's why it was Ute Pass, because the Utes would follow the bison over the pass. Anyway, they come up over the pass and they make a discovery in the Blue River and are very successful. Uh, Spaulding gets credit for the first discovery because he was considered the most experienced prospector, so they let him go first. But Iliff, as you can see, life-changing, right? At almost $2,000 an ounce today, he had $800,000 within a couple of weeks. <laughs> I win, I'm out, right? Enough. Um, and in any case, it was literally like that photo, right? Relatively large um, gold and lots of it very quickly. Um, for the most part, that's not what would, people would find, of course. But he was one of the early lucky ones. So what, found, what happened? Well, they did so well, Spalding and Iliff and their crew, that they decided to hunker down for the winter because they were there July, August time frame. So they built a stockade, not against the Indians, but against the mountain lions and uh, the grizzly bears and the wolves. We had all those things still. And in those days, mountain lions were surprisingly bold around humans and would come steal your stuff. George Andrew Jackson in his journal, for example, talks about shooting a uh, Rocky Mountain sheep and uh, going to sleep, and the next morning he wakes up and the sheep's been dragged off and there's mountain lion footprints all around it. So building a stockade was not, a, not just paranoia about the Native Americans. Um, in any case, they built a stockade and they sent three of their um, prospectors back down to Denver to buy enough supplies to get them through the winter. Well, what do you suppose those prospectors used to pay for the supplies? Yes, they did, they used gold. And what happens when you show up in late summer 1859 when there's several thousand people in Metro Denver and you pay with gold in the shops. Where have you been? Where, where's this guy going? Maybe I should follow him. And you know, winter was coming so it didn't happen, but the gold rush happened. You see my, my third bullet down there, the spring melts of 1860. A bunch of people from Metro Denver come tromping up into the mountains and join these guys and start exploring all over uh, Summit County. Uh, really southern Summit County, to be fair, right? Once you get, once you get past, um, well, geez, even Frisco, you're, you're getting into the less and less and less as you get downstream. But um, interesting note, the best gold was really in the smaller gulches, right? The, the core of the Blue River here, for the most part, is 60 feet of sand and gravel. And so any good-sized piece of gold is going to eventually work its way down deep in that sand and gravel and be really hard to get if all you've got is a shovel and a, a wooden sluice or something like that. Um, but some of the side gulches, like Georgia Gulch, and there's a bunch of them, um, Gold Run is now a fancy neighborhood, but that was one that made lots of people rich in its day. Um, the smaller gulches had less sand and gravel so they could get to the bottom more easily and get to the good gold. Anyway, oh, Breckenridge, Breckenridge, Breckenridge is fun. This one I have to give credit to Bill Fountain on. Um, he recently, like a year or two ago, did the research to pin down exactly what happened with the name of Breckenridge. So it was originally spelled with an E, as you see the first one, and it was named for a mule skinner, which is um, somebody who had a whole chain of mules that he used to haul freight. That mule skinner was with Fremont. Remember Fremont and Gilpin in the 40s, 1840s? Well, they brought contractors, you know, civilian contractors to bring supplies for their cavalry. And there was a guy named Breckenridge, and as they were leaving the Summit County area, they went up over the pass, and um, what's now called Boreas Pass, by the way. And um, he realized that he didn't have all his mules. And so they all had to wait for him while he went back down valley to find his mules and bring the last ones back up. And when they, they, he got back up with them, 
uh, Fremont said that the guys were sitting around bored and joking around and decided to make fun of you, we're going to name this pass Breckenridge Pass. <laughs> okay? So when they first make the town of Breckenridge, it's named after the pass that they've just gone over, right? Probably not knowing it's rather amusing history. Um, however, when they decided to incorporate the town and sell off lots, the developer who did that knew that your town is worth more if you have a post office. And the way you get a post office in those days is it gets approved by the vice president. That was one of the vice presidents of the United States' jobs, was to approve um, important actions by the post office, including setting up new ones. And so they changed the name of the town to the name of the current vice president, and thus the I, Breckenridge. It was that subtle of a change, but that was the guy's name at the time. Now, this is 1860, and what happened in 1861? The Civil War started. And, of course, Abraham Lincoln gets elected. That vice president is out. That vice president, who's still a senator at that point, is um, somebody who's a southerner, and he becomes a treasonist. He leaves the United States and um, abandons his post as a senator and goes to join the Confederacy, where he is in the government there. And so, of course, we can't have that bum's name on our town signage, so they put the E back. And that's how we got to Breckenridge with an E again, which is just a return to where we were, right? Did they get a post office out of the They got a post office out of the deal, and the guy who platted out the town got rich doing it. That was one of the other ways to get rich. There's really three ways to get rich in a gold rush. One is to actually find a bunch of gold. Two is to sell all the supplies to the people who want to find the gold. And the third one is to plat out a town someplace people are excited about and sell the lots which happened several times. Okay, so here's the next bit about booms and busts, right? First of all, in the early 1860s, we have, have all this small-scale gulch placer mining, right, in the smaller gulches where you could get to the bigger gold. And things go great. We end up with over 10,000 people. But look how little time that lasts, less than a decade. And we're down to basically nobody left here. And those that are here, you might wonder what the heck they're doing, right? Um, but... We incorporated in the early 1880s. We get incorporated, Dillon incorporates, the railroads come in. Why is that? Well, because we've figured out the chemistry of how to get the gold out of the rocks here, right? Most of the gold in Colorado, once you get to any significant depth at all, like more than 50 or 100 feet, is tied up with sulfur compounds and other things that make it difficult to separate from the rock um, through simple means. And so we had to work out the chemistry. And there's a whole other talk I give about how that was done. We can't dive into it today, but suffice to say that in the late 1870s, that gets sorted out. And so we get our second boom, which is the hard rock boom. And lots of success with that. And hydraulicing comes in as well. So they're, here they're using um, water jets with, with water pressure from a reservoir up high on a hill, run through a pipe, and then squirt it at the hillside to wash all the hillside dirt into a sluice. So it's a lot less labor, a lot less, a lot less expense as a result. And we had at least five or six, I can come up with six places that were hydraulic around Summit County. Um, one of the easy ones to see is when you're on I-70, if you're heading west, on your right, just past the Silverthorne exit, so between the Frisco exit and Silverthorne, but closer to Silverthorne, on your right, you will see some dirt walls, dirt cliffs kind of that are kind of a yellowish color, yellowish brownish color, that inorganic material that doesn't have anything growing on it is what was left behind by the hydraulic egg. So there used to be a gentle sloping hillside that would have encompassed probably even part of I-70, and that all got washed back by the hydraulic mining operation, um, in mostly in the 1880s, although there were recurrences all the way up until the 1920s of people working in that deposit. Uh, we also had the single bit, largest piece of gold in Colorado ever discovered, uh, was discovered here. It was, I think, somewhere around 14 pounds when it was first discovered, but that includes some rock matrix that was still with it. It's a whole other talk about that one, which is a lot of fun, but it was discovered here and sold to a bank down in Denver, and it's now in the Museum of Nature and Science if you want to go see it. Although it's missing a couple of small pieces. I know a guy who claims that he had one for a while of the small pieces that came off of it. Uh, it's basically priceless because um, the gold itself would be worth several hundred thousand dollars, but because it's the largest piece ever from Colorado, millions. You know, it's a trophy piece in that sense. It's a good question. Yeah. And then finally, we had one more rush in the early, 18, in the early 1900s. The gold dredges came in, 
And you all probably have seen some of the results of that. We used to have great huge dredge piles of cobbles lined up from Farmer's Corner all the way to Breckenridge. Now we have one little pile left for you to look at. But if you go up French Gulch, you can still see what that looked like. Um, they've been removing the piles up the Swan River and converting it into what looks like a golf course, which I get a little cranky about because we're essentially obliterating our history. But, you know, that's how the county wants it. So what are you going to do? Uh, the dredges were essentially made successful by electricity. There were attempts at dredging running steam power, and they couldn't get enough power to dig deep enough to get to the gold, so they went bankrupt. And once Stanley Revit, uh, Ben Stanley Revit thought to put um, electrical motors on the dredges, and so a lot less weight on the dredge, you know, because you have the generating station somewhere else and a wire running to your dredge, and you could get a lot more power out of those electric motors, and they were able to get all the way down to bedrock, and they made a lot of money starting in 1905 all the way up until the early 1940s, which was really the end of significant gold mining in Colorado. So the last dredging, 1942, they went bankrupt um, right on the edge of Breckenridge uh, a matter of months before they would have been told to shut down anyway because of the war effort, as it happens. Uh, the last large-scale mine, the Wellington, didn't close until 1973, just up French Gulch on the left. It stayed in operation because it was producing a whole bunch of metals. Uh, the most important one during World War II was zinc. You know, think galvanized steel that doesn't rust. It, you're galvanizing or plating it with zinc. So it was incredibly important war material. And there was also some copper and gold and silver and lead coming out of the Wellington, but the zinc was crucial. And it's what kept it operating into the 1970s when inflation killed it. Uh, and of course, there's still some going on today. You see this map of the state. The orange boxes are um, survey sections that have placer mines, and the blue ones today. And the blue ones are hard rock mines that exist today. These are all active in the federal government's database. I went and got an updated map just the other day for this presentation. Um, so I know this is absolutely current. Um, there's over 125 mines in our county alone today. There are hundreds across Colorado. The key thing for you to know is, of course, the regulations are a little different than they used to be. So most of these mines, you would never notice they existed because they keep things so tidy and so low key. There's no plume of crap in the, excuse my language, in the stream. There's no cloud of dust coming up because all of that is so strictly regulated, right? But they do exist. And in fact, that one right there is mine. <laughs> so they're out there. Um, let's see. Let's press on. So where can I see the history? And of course, you know some of these answers already, right? The Frisco Historic Park and Museum is a great start. Summit Historic Society has interesting stuff, not as much about the gold, but about the history of the county, what it was like for people who lived here. Am I totally in your way? I'm sorry. And um, Breck Heritage Alliance does a lot of stuff related to gold because most of it is really kind of clustered around Breckenridge. The mining in Frisco, for example, leaned more towards silver on the whole, although I have an expert here that if you have questions about Frisco mining, she's the one to speak to, not me. Um, Dillon was never really a mining town. It was more of a trading town. Even all the way back to the fur traders in the early 1800s, Dillon existed for a long time. Um, but there's lots of things you can do. The Lomax plaster that's listed here is a place you can learn to gold pan, and you can see hydraulicing. That area was hydraulic uh, back in the day. Uh, the Washington mine up the hill from Breck a little bit is, your phone's possessed, sir. Um, the Washington mine is a hard rock mine that you can tour. And you can also see a sequence of pieces of equipment of how they process the hard rock successfully. What did they have to do to it to get the gold out? Um, and then, of course, they do a lot of historic tours. The Country Boy Mine is a special friend for me because I'm good friends with the current owner who's done a lot to invest and renovate and improve that experience. So I'd highly recommend that as a mine tour at this point. And um, he also has some of my gold available, as does Nature's Own in Breckenridge. Um, and then, of course, Summit County Open Space. Kind of our friends and kind of not our friends because they tend to want to make things pretty and obliterate history that makes me cranky, but they're also doing good things to preserve stuff, like the Riling Dredge and the Busiris Dredge. That are, The Riling is up French Gulch, and the Busiris is up Swan River a little bit, up Tiger Run Road. right? 
Um, and both of those are preserved by, by um, Summit County Open Space, so yay them for that. And lots of hiking trails and things, of course. So, can I go pan? Yes, but no, right? So first no is you can't, you can't gold pan on open space or parklands in, in Summit County. Uh, the county about 15 years ago bought uh, 14,000, 15,000 acres from a mining company that was still holding a bunch of um, private land that was old mines and old deposits. And they, before that, you could go dig on those lands because the mining company didn't care about small scale recreational kind of stuff. Um, but the county does, so no more, right? Where else can you not? Well, when they created Lake Dillon in the early, 18, in the early 1960s, they drew a big box around it and said no prospecting, not even no mining, but no prospecting. So I can't even use a gold pan, let alone bring in a, a bulldozer and start digging um, anywhere near Lake Dillon because they didn't want water quality issues with the water getting into the lake, right? So there's a big no-go around that. But there are places you can go, like the Lomax mine that I mentioned earlier that teaches gold panning, the Country Boy, the Washington mine. And I say your house or our friends, because an awful lot of us are on property that has at least a little bit of gold. My next door neighbors in Silverthorne drilled a new water well and, uh, this past winter. And when they did it, they let me come in with a bucket and gather up some of the stuff that came spewing out when they were drilling. And I found about a dozen little tiny specks of gold that I gave back to my neighbors as a gift in a little display container, you know, a little trophy case like, like this kind of thing, right? Um, so that they'd have the souvenir of gold from their own property. Um, there's even more, that's down in Silverthorne. If you're upstream, like in Breckenridge, um, there's stories of people digging holes for fence posts and finding gold nuggets. Not big ones, but all the same nuggets that you could pick up and play with. Uh, so it's out there still, and you know, it wasn't all dug for various reasons. Um, so it's there. And then, of course, unclaimed um, Forest Service lands, like where I filed my mining claim before I filed it. It was unclaimed Forest Service land, and so you can file there. There's lots of regulations about how you do that and what you're allowed to do and what you're not, of course. You can't cut down trees, for, for example, stuff like that. And then uh, Bureau of Reclamation land, um, Green Mountain Reservoir is reclamation, which is, reclamation is a funny word when it comes to the federal government. They don't mean reclamation. What they mean is building reservoirs for power production and stormwater flooding management and things like that. They're not actually reclaiming anything. Um, in any case, though, here's a picture of where you can go in Summit County. So Green Mountain Reservoir up at the top would be the Bureau of Reclamation stuff. And um, Blue River Campground is right on Highway 9 as you're headed toward uh, Green Mountain. And you can pan in the river there and then a few other spots. And as you see my notes, uh, Buffalo Plasters number three is the, the old uh, hydrauliking area. It's dry only because that's close enough to the reservoir that you're not allowed to use any water for prospecting purposes. But you are allowed to do anything that is dry, which there is technology for that, using um, a blower to separate the lighter material from the heavier stuff, gold being the heavier stuff. And then you can see, you can get on 10 Mile Creek, you can get on uh, the Snake River, and uh, the only stuff you can do around, around Breck, unfortunately, is the uh, pay-to-play activities at the historic sites. There's literally nowhere in the river that you can go pan today, which someday when I'm in charge of the world, they'll designate a panning park. <laughs> but we did that down in Denver. Um, the place that um, Jackson and Gregory spent the winter, remember those first people who were successful, was um, just downstream of the Coors plant. And we got the... Jefferson County authorities and the Wheat Ridge City authorities to agree to create a prospecting park there about 10 years ago, not quite. And uh, today there's a quarter mile section of the river that's designated as a prospecting park and you are digging in the exact same spot those guys were. And it's gonna be hard to dig enough gold to feed yourself these days, but there's still gold there and people still you know, come away happy with the experience. So hopefully someday we'll have that here. So where can I dig across the state? Well. Chapter E in my book, where the big red arrow points, is where we are today. But the book covers all of the major placer mining and hard rock mining um, areas of the state that had gold in them. The, the gold-colored counties are all the counties that had mining districts, but not all the mining districts were gold-related. Like down in the southeast, you see Huerfano and Castilla County. Uh, that was mostly coal and some iron ore that went uh, to Pueblo. Same with Custer County, although Custer has some silver and a tiny bit of gold. In any case, 
Um, what I covered for the book was all the major gold mining districts, which ends up focused around the towns that were created by the gold miners, right? Like Breckenridge and, and Frisco and, and um, Cripple Creek and so on. So my book covers all of those, where you can dig as a casual visitor, but also the history, um, where you might want to stay, if there's something cool and historic. I even, in the course of the book, made sure I had the five oldest bars that were around during the gold rush era. Um, like there's one down in Silverton that still has a bullet hole in the back bar, you know, where they have the big old mirror so the bartender can see what's going on without turning around. Well, up in the corner, there's a bullet hole still from, you know. So when I did the research for the book and we got there, I said to my wife, well, I have to go into that bar and have a shot of whiskey just like they would have back in the day, you know. I didn't drink the cheap stuff they would have had, though, I'll tell you that. In any case, you can see there's a lot of gold mining all over the state, and it basically sequenced um, from the northeast. So you see A, B, C, D, that was 1859. E is really 1860 by the time you get there. Um, F was 59 and 60. Leadville was really 60. Um, the southwest part of the state was in the 1870s. Cripple Creek kind of stands on its own as a very late discovery, and there's a whole other talk on what happened in Cripple Creek, but the gold rush there didn't start until 1890s, so much later. And then um, up in the northwest, where in Moffat County near Craig, there were some efforts, but there's not much water up there, so it was really tough to get a commercial operation going. But I will tell you, there's some decent gold up there in the, Moffitt, in the Yampa River and whatnot. So, pretty cool. That one's interesting, too, because we're not really sure where that gold came from. There's no hard rock deposit. It's old gravel layers between layers in the ground that don't have any obvious source, and it's a bit mysterious, even to the geologists. So anyway, my passions for all this stuff led to the fun of talking to folks like you, but um, not just one book, but now three, thanks to COVID. <laughs> you know, the lockdown last fall led to finishing the next two books. So. Um, the first one, the, the guidebook, is almost 500 pages, black and white, tons of detail, GPS coordinates of where to go, all kinds of things like that. And one of the things we heard was, well, we want more pictures. There's like one photo per chapter in there. Because if you added more pictures, the 500 book turns into a 600 page book and the prices go up. And if you want color, this book is $26 on Amazon. It would be an $80 book if you made it in color. And it would just be a brick, you know, because color pages are heavier and the whole thing. So people kept asking. So my wife, who'd come along and it, as a semi-professional photographer, um, made a photo book of the, its inspiring images. The What does she say? The beauty of Colorado gold country. So some of it is actual mining stuff. Like here's Mayflower Gulch I randomly turned to, right? But here's also Mayflower Gulch. <laughs> that's just gorgeous, right? To remind you that you should go back in the summertime and see the flowers, right? Um, so we got that one out as well. And then for the people who are serious prospectors, I'd been whining for years about wanting to be able to keep track of my work. So I created a prospecting log. And my wife was nice enough to dig through her archive of photos and pick out pictures so each page has a different photo. Like this one's the North London Mill. She went looking for stuff that would look good in a two by three format in black and white, right? Which is not every picture you take, right? I mean, a picture of a bunch of flowers on a hillside in black and white mostly looks like a bunch of weeds on a hillside. It's not very impressive. So she had to kind of wade through and, and pick things out, but um, we got that one out this past fall too. Oh, and the, this picture is kind of fun because that's a tenth ounce gold piece, which is about the size of a dime. So it's a little bigger in the picture than real life, which is important context because that means the gold's a little bigger in the picture than real life too, but that's all my gold. So that's the largest piece I ever found myself which was from Mosquito Creek over near Fair Play in Alma. And then a lot of what you find is what they used to call gold dust. But it adds up. It adds up. I've made several rings with my gold. People always ask, well, what do you do with it? Um, I've made several rings, including the wedding band my wife wears now, and um, helped my daughter gather the gold for the wedding band that we had custom made for her husband when she got married. And then I have one for myself as well with some of the leftovers, you know. Anyway. Um, that's pretty much the whole presentation. I'd love to field more questions, and I can also do a little bit of show and tell if you want with the stuff. Okay, show and tell first. All right, first of all, gold pans. The old timers use metal, plastic is a lot better. And um, some people like green because you can see the gold against the green and the dark sand. 
I personally like black better because you can see the gold even better against black. And I'm not worried about the dark sand because I'll get that separated from the gold when I get home. Right? Uh, but this is what you're really talking about these days when you talk about a gold pan. They do make smaller ones. Um, these are the size I happen to like. These, this also gives you a good example. There's different ideas about what the riffles should look like. So there's a zillion different designs of gold pan. The other thing that can help a lot is a classifier, or a sieve, or a screen, right? We call them classifiers. You put that on top, you shovel your dirt in there, splash in a little water so all the small stuff falls through. You toss the big stuff aside because the sad truth is there ain't no big gold. <laughs> okay, so you do that for a while, and you end up with some gold in the bottom of your pan. How do I get it out? <laughs> Suction pipette. Look at how little the end of that is. If you find a piece of gold bigger than goes through your suction pipette, first of all, do the happy dance. <laughs> and then second, pick it up with your fingers and quit whining about this not working, right? Where does the gold go? In a little vial. Remember we said this will hold almost $1,000 worth of gold. So it's going to be plenty for what you're doing today, right? And again, if you find a piece of gold that doesn't fit in here, do the happy dance twice, and then quit whining about the mouth of this being too small for your gold, because you found a nice big piece, right? My biggest piece ever wouldn't fit in one of these vials, and I didn't have any problem getting it home without losing it, believe me. You fold that thing up in a $50 bill and put it in your wallet where it's safe and sound, right? In any case, this is the key thing that most people don't know when they first go out, is, well, what are you actually going to do with the gold when you find it, right? And of course, the suction pipette is less than a buck. The vial's less than a buck. It's not a big deal to get these things. Um, a lot of places that sell panning kits do include that kind of equipment, which is good. Um, Panning, though, can be a lot of hard work. And if you're trying to like, do it for several hours, you're, you're squatted down, you're sloshing the, the material in the river, trying to wash off the lighter stuff and keep the gold. And you're starting to think, well, this is a lot of work. What else could I do? So you get yourself a sluice, which has a leaf in it. And um, you set that up in the river. So the water's flowing through here. And you shovel into it here, maybe using a classifier first to get the big rocks out. right? But you're, you're putting material in here. The water's flowing. And as the material falls over these little drops in it, the heavier stuff is going to fall in there and stay, and the lighter stuff is going to flow over the heavy stuff and get washed away. Right? And so you can put you know, 10 gallons worth of material into this thing before you clean it out into a, into a gold pan you know, and pan it out. And so you're doing a lot less panning and moving a lot more dirt and hopefully getting a lot more gold. These two, there's a zillion different designs of. You know, every creative prospector who's been at this for a little while thinks they have their own idea of what a sluice should, should look like. And so there's ones with carpet in them and different kinds of metal riffles and all kinds of crazy designs. I like to bring this one for show and tell because you can see exactly what's happening, right? You can imagine the heavy stuff falling into these little drop zones, right, and staying there for you. Not it. All right. All right, great. Thanks for your attendance, everybody. I really appreciate it. <laughs>